Hey guys, is it working? Okay, good. Um, my name is Rachel and I make first aids for Stuffed Panda Studios. Oh, thank you, Suki. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and this panel is about airbrushing and dry brushing for fursuits. So I'm curious, how many of you guys already own an airbrush? Not too many. So that's actually good because I'm going to talk about um, different types of airbrushes and like compressors and stuff like that that you need to get. So if you already have one, just sit tight and then I'll get to the techniques after that. So sometimes people ask me why I airbrush suits because there are a lot of people out there who don't airbrush their suits at all. They just, you know, sew and trim it and it looks great as is. So it's definitely not a requirement, but it's something that can add like extra pizzazz to it or make it look more realistic. So it just kind of depends on the style and what you're going for. Um, airbrushing is really great for like blending colors or creating gradients. That's something that you can't really get just by sewing fur. And you can also use it to make really soft, kind of translucent markings. So that always looks pretty neat. And color correction, um, sometimes you can't find the exact color of fur that you want, or you've got a fur that when you trim it down, it uh, changes color because the base of it is different. And you can use airbrushing to kind of correct that um, so it looks you know, closer to the color that you're envisioning. Um, like I said before, you can use it to make stuff look more realistic, kind of get some color variation like contouring and stuff. Um, and then it also makes suits look really striking in photos and from a distance. Because I always try and keep in mind what suits look like. If you see them, you know, from a decent distance across the room, um, if you see them in photos, I want them to look like really cool from a distance. Um, and that really helps with that. And if you have a lot of markings like tiger stripes, cheetah spots, things like that, it can often be cheaper and faster to airbrush it rather than like sewing everything in. Um, so tuni or kimono suits are an example of like really minimal airbrushing. Um, on my tuni stuff, I just kind of use it to sharpen markings and maybe make some areas pop a bit, but I try not to over airbrush it. And then these are examples of really detailed airbrushing that I do um, on realistic stuff. And I'll go back to the first slide real quick. You can see like the huge difference between before airbrushing and after. So on my realistic suits, it makes a huge difference. And they always look really funky before I do any kind of airbrushing on it. So when you're looking for airbrushes, you might have noticed two different styles of airbrushes. There's some that have like that little paint cap on top over here. And then you've got some that have the paint bottle on the bottom. And that is a, the one with the paint on top is a gravity feed. And the one underneath is a siphon feed. And that's, it's just kind of personal preference. Uh, the gravity feed airbrushes don't hold nearly as much paint because you've just got that little um, cap on the top, or is it the siphon feed you can attach, you know, a bigger bottle of paint. And for me personally, I use the gravity feed because when I had the siphon feed airbrush, it tended to get clogged more in my experience. And it might have just been me, but, you know, I've had better luck with the gravity feed ones. So, um, and the only downside to that is you have to make sure the cap is on really tight. Because there have been a few times I've been airbrushing. I don't think about it and I'll tilt the airbrush to get like underneath an angle and the cap falls off or it starts to leak and that is terrible. <laughs> uh, there was one suit I did where the entire face was fleece and it fell off and it was just black paint and just soaked in and spread everywhere. So yeah, I ended up having to take all of the muzzle fleece off and redo it. So that's something you'd have to watch out for. Um, some other basic supplies you need are a compressor, and you also need a moisture trap depending on the humidity level where you live. And with compressors, um, you want it to at least generate 30 PSI. It's nice if you can get one where you can adjust the PSI on it. 
the first compressor I got was really cheap, and I think it only did 20 or 25 PSI. And I kept having troubles with my airbrush clogging, and I would ask other fursuit makers, or I'd look up tutorials, and everyone's like, oh, that's just the way airbrushes are. They clog all the time. You spend 75% of your time trying to get clogs out. So I'm like, okay, I guess that's the way it is. And when that one finally died, after like six years, I got a new compressor that had higher PSI, and that issue went away. So I'm like, wow, I was struggling for this with this for six years. <laughs> and it could have been fixed by getting a higher PSI. So it just kind of helps push clogs through um, a little bit easier. So that's something to kind of look out for. And then something else is a moisture trap. And that's what this is down here. You can get it on the compressor itself, which you can kind of see um, if I can get the show up over here. And you can get it on the actual airbrush as well. And basically when you're in a humid environment, during the summer especially, it'll start collecting moisture in the line. And that kind of helps catch it. And even in the summer for me, um, when it gets really humid, both moisture traps on the compressor and the airbrush can fill up if I'm not paying attention. And then you'll be in the middle of airbrushing, you'll just spit out this huge blob of water and your paint just goes everywhere. <laughs> so it is very helpful if you live in a humid area, um, but you still have to kind of monitor it and make sure you're actually emptying it out every once in a while. Because sometimes I get in a groove and I just do not pay attention. <laughs> Um, paint, people ask me about a lot, and honestly you can use any kind of acrylic paint. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, you can go and just use acrylic paint from Walmart. It'll work just fine. Uh, but the difference is with high quality airbrush paint, it's more concentrated, so you have to do less layers. Like if you got um, black, just black acrylic paint from Walmart and you used airbrush reducer in it, uh, and you were doing black stripes, you probably have to do several passes to get like really dark black, but if you're using actual airbrush paint, it's going to be really intense and you'll probably only have to do one pass, maybe two. So I'm going to have my sister pass this around. And this is my favorite paint of all time. It is Golden High Flow Paint. And it's already, you know, kind of the thickness you would want for airbrushing, so you don't have to reduce it any at all. And you don't want to open it because it's highly concentrated and will go everywhere, but you can shake it and hear how thin it is. But that is by far my favorite brand of paint for anything, even just like doing regular paintings. Um, if you do choose, oops, the screen decided to disappear on me. Okay, if you do choose to use regular acrylic paint and you just don't want to spend the money on airbrush paint because it is pretty expensive, you can get what's called a reducer and you mix it with the paint and it thins it out enough that it can go through the airbrush without issues. And there's a couple of different brands I've tried. Um, Liquitex, I believe, has um, a reducer that's clear and I've gotten it from like Hobby Lobby before. But my favorite is once again, the golden airbrush medium and it looks white in the bottle but once you mix it with the paint it dries completely clear and on the bottle it says it's used for um, airbrushing t-shirts and stuff like that so that's the one I'd recommend but again any kind of reducer would work any brand I would not use water that's what I did when I first started because I didn't know that there's a difference between the reducer and water and when you try an airbrush fur, it'll just beat up on top if you've used water to thin it out. So it'll just be really frustrating if you try and do that. Some other stuff you're going to need is airbrush cleaner, um, which not only cleans out your airbrush, but you can also use it to get paint back off of fur if it hasn't dried yet. And a cleaning pot, which is down here. And that's not entirely necessary, but it provides a nice place for your airbrush to sit so you don't accidentally knock it over because it's, it's glass, so it's pretty heavy. And then you can also use it to actually clean out your airbrush. So if you've got a little bit of paint left, you actually just spray it into the pot and it collects in there. And then when it starts to get full, you can empty it out. And it's also got a little filter in there, so that helps uh, keep fumes you know, and paint out of the air. 
And I didn't mention it here, but I just thought of, you really need a respirator. You should not be airbrushing without a mask because breathing in paint is not good. <laughs> so get some kind of respirator that says it's good for um, like spray painting and that should take care of it. Um, hairspray is really nice to have, believe it or not. When you're airbrushing long fur especially, I'll put down a thin coat of hairspray and it holds the fur in place so that you can actually airbrush it without it moving around. Another thing you'll need are fine paint brushes, preferably ones you have absolutely destroyed. <laughs> I would not get like really nice clean paint brushes. And I've got an example of my sad paint brushes to pass around. But they actually work better if you've got really old paint brushes where a lot of paint and stuff is dried in it because it's almost like a brush, like a scrubby brush that you can use um, when you're painting details. If you've got a really nice clean brush, you're going to have a hard time, you know, getting it to stick on the fur. Let's pass that around. Uh, you want multiple brushes and combs. You do not just want one brush and comb. I have one that is completely clean. I've got one for dark colors, and I've got one for lighter colors, and then I've got another just for white paint. And the reason behind it is if you're airbrushing something white, and then you take the comb that you've used for dark paint, even if it's dry, it'll re-wet that paint and put streaks through your project. And I've done that when I'm in a hurry, not paying attention, grab the wrong comb, brush it through white fur, and then you get like these black streaks on the muzzle. <laughs> so you wanna pay attention and kind of have several combs for different colors, keep them separated. And last but not least, have some small sewing scissors. Again, preferably ones that are older and kind of already destroyed a bit. You don't want to use super nice ones you use for sewing. Um, and the reason is, as you're airbrushing, the air from the airbrush will start ruffling up the fur in areas. And you will almost always come across places where you didn't trim it as well as you thought, or there's a little long tuft that was hiding because it was tucked behind the ear and you need to trim it, so it's good to have that kind of stuff on hand. And before you start airbrushing, um, I want to talk about trimming a little bit because the way you trim it can dramatically affect what your airbrushing turns out to look like. So on realistic stuff where I'm going to be doing a lot of heavy airbrushing, you want it to be really short in areas where you're going, going to do a lot of detail. With Toony stuff, you can get away with leaving it a little bit longer because generally I'm not doing anything detailed or putting a lot of paint on. So I will have her start passing that suit around so you can look at the length of the fur on the muzzle and around the tear ducts. Yes. So around noses, I try and cut it as short as I can. And also around tear ducts, I cut it as short as I can. And on realistic suits, I will usually actually trim to the backing around tear ducts. I know a lot of people are afraid of doing that, but if you're going to be doing heavy airbrushing on top of it, it's going to completely disappear. You'll never see it again. You'll have no idea that it was trimmed to the backing and it actually blends in better because I don't know, you've noticed sometimes if you leave the fur longer around the tear ducts, then no matter how much blending you do, um, you can catch shadows from different kinds of lighting and then the tear ducts show up, you know, and are really noticeable anyway, despite how much blending you've done. So it's really important to trim it super short around areas like that. And these are up close examples of how short I trim different suits. Uh, the third one is the one that's getting passed around so you can see what it looked like before airbrushing. And you can probably kind of see in the photo um, where I did trim it to the backing. And you can see the edges aren't super sharp and clean. And that actually makes it better to blend in as well, not having like a super sharp, clean line around things like that. So once you've got everything trimmed and you're ready to start airbrushing, the first thing you need to do is do a lot of research. You need to kind of decide what you want to achieve before you start. Um, do you want to do like full realistic airbrushing? Do you just want to do some gradients or color correction? 
just deciding kind of what you're going to do will make the process a little bit easier. Uh, you want to gather any reference materials that you need. If you're airbrushing a realistic snow leopard, you want to gather as many different um, reference photos as you can from different angles and different lighting situations and see what they all have in common and see what kind of airbrushing you need to do to achieve that realistic look. And digital overlays are very helpful. I use Procreate sometimes and I'll actually take pictures of the suit before I start airbrushing and I'll just kind of do an overlay and block in different shading and colors and kind of see what works. Um, sometimes I'll get stuck on stuff, especially toony, since it is minimal airbrushing. And doing an overlay really helps me decide exactly what I want to do or what would be too much and make it look weird. And then another weird technique I do is I will save little pieces of felt or paper and I will cut that out in the shape um, of different markings and lay it on the suit and stand back before I do any airbrushing. So um, one of the cats I did, I don't know, oh yeah, on the front slide, um, all those little markings that were on the cat, I actually cut out with felt ahead of time, laid on top to make sure it was what I wanted before I did any airbrushing because I was really scared of messing that one up because I was on a short deadline with it. So. so if you're nervous about it, that is a really good way to check and see what it actually looks like before you do anything drastic. Um, the working order I typically go in is I'll do any color correction first. So if there's a fur where the color needs to be changed or lightened or something, that happens first. Typically I work light to dark. Um, then I'll clean up any edges, start doing some blending. Then I'll go into any gradients I want to do. I'll do contouring next. And then the very last thing I do are all the really fun like details and little markings, which is my favorite part once I finally get to that point. So I have a video of this. We'll see if it actually plays. But you want to be aware of her direction. Um, if you're trying to airbrush against the fur or paint against the fur, you're going to have a really bad time. So you want to always try and aim your airbrush down the length of fur. And sometimes you can't, like I said before, if the lid of your airbrush is going to pop off or it's going to come out the air hole on the top of the airbrush, you can't turn your airbrush upside down. You might have to find creative ways to move your piece around or prop it up so you can airbrush it at the angle that you need to. Um, you want to practice moving your airbrush closer and further away. The closer you get to your piece, the more the fur is just going to blow outward. So, for example, on this tail, let's see if it actually plays. Yay! Um, you can see I'm not super duper close because if I get really close, like I said, it'll blow the fur out. So on longer fur, I tend to hold the airbrush back a little bit. Um, you also want to use, this is the point where you could start using hairspray as well to kind of get the fur to behave and stay in a certain direction, especially if you're airbrushing something longer. If you've got any long tufts of hair or wigs, anything like that, you can use big clips or like scrunchies or something to kind of pull it out of the way so you don't accidentally airbrush something that you shouldn't. Um, sometimes like I'll be airbrushing a detailed design on the muzzle and the angle I have to hold the airbrush at, it wants to kind of overspray onto like the cheeks or somewhere else. So sometimes I've even taken like felt and just wrapped up most of the piece so just the muzzles exposed so I don't accidentally, you know, get overspray on something. So this is an older suit, but it's, a, it's an example of color correction that I did. The fur I used on the face, that tan, it was like this really light tan, but when you shaved it down, it turned a darker brown. And that's not really what we were going for. So I used airbrushing to kind of bring it back to its original color as best as I could. And the best way to go about this is using multiple thin layers and letting it dry in between. I think a lot of people get frustrated because they just try and put on a heavy layer and it looks nothing like what they want or it looks patchy and they get frustrated. 
But the key is really to do layers and be patient, even though it's really difficult to be patient, and let it dry in between. Um, if you're on kind of a deadline, then sometimes I'll take a heat gun on low or a blow dryer and kind of dry out the top before I do the next layer. And typically it takes me like three layers to really do a good color correction to where it looks right. Um, when I work from light to dark, uh, I try and take it as slow as I can. Honestly, half the time I spend airbrushing, it's just me standing back and staring at it and deciding exactly what I want to do. And um, yeah, it's just important to stand back and kind of see how it's progressing and see if it's looking like what you want. If you are doing a darker marking, like if you want a black stripe and you're nervous about it, you can start out with like dark brown or gray, see if you like it, and then go on to the full black. Um, even though I've airbrushed for a really long time, I still do this because I'm just not confident enough to put straight up black on it the first time. And it just makes me feel better seeing it and being 100% sure what I want before I put on that really dark color. Um, so an example on Yukiko is under the eye there. I started out with actually a dark brown um, to kind of get that eyeliner going before I went in with the black at the very end. And also if you do like a lighter color, like a dark brown instead of black, it is easier to take off if you genuinely don't like the way it looks. If it's still wet, you can use airbrush cleaner and kind of scrub on it lightly and get it out. Um, if it's like on a tail or something, you could potentially submerge it with soap and water and get it out that way as well. But on a head, um, it's easier just to use airbrush cleaner. So after I've done any color correction and I've started kind of working from light to dark, I usually blend and soften edges next. So I'll take the airbrush and I'll kind of overlap the edge of it. Um, so you can see on Yukiko again, the orange isn't like perfectly smooth where it meets the white. It's a little choppy looking. So I took, I tried to get um, an orange color that was as close as possible. And I airbrushed on the edge of that orange and let it overlap the white just a little bit. So I get that soft, soft edge on it. Um, sometimes, especially on white, I'll do this darker orange color then I'll come back with pure white airbrush paint, airbrush over that edge again, and then come back for the third layer with that orange. So you've basically got three layers of color, and that really seems to blend and hide that raw edge better than just straight up taking the orange and going across it one time. And if you've got any sharp edges that you want, those I typically do last. I try and do all the soft, like, blendy ones first, and then the hard edges at the very end. So this is kind of what I was talking about. You want to layer multiple colors and again let them dry completely in between. And it does take a lot of time, it's slow, but it does produce a better result in the end. So the first one, like I said, you can see how choppy this is, um, especially like right there. It doesn't come and connect with the nose, it kind of jogs out a little bit. And a lot of this is because, I don't know, there are a lot of people who can sew and get really crisp markings, but I've never been good at that. So I, I don't worry about it too much because I know I'm going to be doing airbrushing over it anyway. Um, but the second one is where I took the orange and kind of started trying to curve it out. The third photo, I took a little bit of a darker color because I saw that the orange wasn't really quite covering it up the way I wanted. So I knew I needed to go a step down um, and get it a little bit darker. The fourth photo is where I overlaid that white. So you can see that's already starting to blend it in way better than what the first photo, you know, was looking like. And then the final photo is where I went back in with a paintbrush and did like the little details on top of it. So by the time you've, you've done all these blending layers and then you get the little details on top, it's completely hidden and you don't see that, you know, jagged edge that you had before. 
this is another blending example I did. Again, it's an older suit, but it had a pretty grand transformation, so it's still a good one to look at. Um, on that one, most of the blending was around the muzzle, and also here under the eyes, it was super choppy. Uh, since this was an older suit, it was even, the markings are even more choppy than what I do now, so it definitely needed a lot of help. So another blending technique that you can use, and I don't know, I do, I did bring an example. Um, I do this on muzzles a lot, is I will airbrush like gray, brown, whatever it is around the nose and the center of the muzzle, and I want it to fade out and look really soft. So I will actually take, um, I put airbrush reducer on here, but actually what I meant was airbrush cleaner. I'll put a little bit on a towel, and I will actually kind of smear it out. So not only does it lighten um, what I put on, but it kind of drags it out and does a nice gradient. So on the right side, you can see where I smeared it. And I pretty much exclusively use that around muzzles and noses. I don't really use that technique anywhere else, but it looks really nice. Because um, sometimes it's kind of hard to get a super soft gradient with just the airbrush. And I seem to have better luck doing that. And I also did that on Panda a little bit. Um, another blending technique that I do a lot is I will use combs to smear paint, which is where that um, the combs thing comes back into play where I've got combs for different colors. So you can actually put on little dots of paint with your paintbrush, and then you take a comb and you smear it out, and it makes these nice little streaks that kind of look like guard hairs. And on Yukiko's suit, I don't have a picture of it, but I was using two different orange furs. One of them had guard hairs and the other didn't. So what I did is I took paint and I kind of put little dots all over it and then I took a comb while it was still wet and just brushed it out. And that created the illusion of guard hairs on top so it kind of blended in better than just having it solid. Um, I do have an example of that. It's not very pretty, but you can kind of see how I put dots across and then on this side I brushed it down. There are probably some other cool effects you could get with it. I haven't played with it too much, but I usually use it around like eyebrows um, and muzzles and stuff like that. As you're going, you want to brush the fur. Um, there's a couple different ways you can go about it. Again, you can brush it while it's wet, which will create the smearing. Sometimes that's what you want. Um, on this tail, I actually did brush it while it was wet because I wanted it to be soft and kind of fade out. If you want it to be a really crisp marking, wait until it's totally dry and then go back in and brush it out. And the reason you want to brush it out is it kind of softens it up because you know if you put a lot of paint on an area, it gets kind of stiff and crunchy. So if you do brush it out after it's dry really thoroughly, um, that does kind of get rid of a lot of that. So like when I did a cheetah suit, um, I airbrushed all the black spots on, I let it totally dry, I came back in like brushed the heck out of it to get it really soft, and that did kind of um, lighten up the markings a bit. So I went back in, airbrushed them one more time, let it dry, brushed again, and then it looked perfect. So just doing that extra step um, just makes it a little softer, makes it look a little more realistic. So it's worth taking the extra time usually. So contouring is when you add shadows and highlights to kind of give the illusion of a shape or highlight shapes that are already there. Because sometimes you'll have like these great shapes on the base, it looks amazing, it's exactly what you want, and then you fur it and you trim it. And you can see the shape in person when you're holding it up close, but from a distance it just looks like a blob, like you can't see it anymore. And that's always really frustrating. So contouring will re-highlight the shapes that are already there. You can add back in shadows, highlights, and that makes kind of the shape more visible to people, especially from a distance or in photos. So you can see again on Yukiko, I had like the little eyebrow dots that were built into the base and I did pattern around them so they were there. You could see them up close 
But obviously in that middle photo, it's just kind of disappeared. You can't really see it. Um, so by adding those shadows and highlights back in, like I did over here, that makes it show up again. And it's kind of the same thing under the eye. You could see it in person, you could see that little dip, but once I got that white fur on, it was just so bright, you, it just didn't show up anymore at all. So up here I added some shadows to kind of make it visible. Um, when you decide where to contour, you want to get, again, a lot of reference photos. Look at all the photos and see what they have in common. Is there shadows and highlights like in the same place? Like, do they always have eyebrow dots in the same place? Um, are there cheekbones generally in the same, you know, area? Those are things that you want to highlight and bring into your suit and your airbrushing to make it look more like the animal that you're you're trying to create. And I'm not like a super hyper realistic um, airbrusher, so I can't really speak to what you would do to make it crazy realistic, but. That's generally what I try and look for is things that really make the species look like the species and kind of incorporate it into my work so people can tell um, what kind of animal it's supposed to be. And again, you can use felt um, or overlays to kind of test your ideas and, and see if it's going to look good. Um, sometimes I'll, you know, airbrush like around whisker dots or not whisker dots, but like eyebrow dots and things because I'm trying to make it look closer to the animal, but then it might accidentally make it look angry or sad or something. So it's always kind of good to test that out ahead of time. Make sure it's not going to change the expression that you're going for. So this cheetah was also one that looked totally different after it was airbrushed. Um, this one had a lot of contouring on it. It had a lot of really cool shapes on the base, but because the fur was so light, I used like this honey fur and white. Again, all of it just disappeared. It made it look really angry and kind of weird. <laughs> so it needed a lot of airbrushing. Um, I just started from light to dark and kind of started trying to build up and get those cheetah shapes going. Um, when I was looking at cheetahs, they really had, you know, distinct cheekbones and the dots above the eyes, so that's kind of what I was trying to work towards when I was going that way. So you can see here, it might be kind of hard to see on the screen, um, I'll have other pictures closer up, of what it looked like when I started getting more of the contouring on. It started really looking more like a cheetah again. And so when you're working on contouring or anything really, you want to set it back and stand back and see what it looks like from a distance. If you're staring at it up close all the time, you might get like great details, but then you stand back and maybe the mesh isn't blending in right. Maybe the shadows are a little too heavy and it makes it look angry. So you definitely want to stand back and take a look every once in a while, take a break, see what it looks like. Um, if you don't have enough space in your room, you could also use a mirror and kind of just stand back while you're holding it and see what it looks like that way. And that's also a good way to check the symmetry because sometimes you'll be airbrushing and you're like, hey, this looks pretty symmetrical and you stand back and look in the mirror and it's like really off. So that's a good thing to check. And another way is to actually uh, take a photo just with your cell phone and look at it that way. Especially if it's gonna be a suit that you anticipate will be photographed a lot. That's a good way to see what your airbrushing is looking like. So when I was first doing the contouring on this, I went a little too dark too fast. And again, you can just use airbrush cleaner to kind of lighten it up. Maybe you can use like water and soap on a towel also, just to kind of back off a bit. So don't panic if it starts looking too dark, you can get it back off um, if you do it fairly quickly and don't let it completely dry. So there's a good um, progression of the contouring I did. First one has no paint at all. The second, I start kind of doing the shadows. Uh, the third is where I lightened it up a bit and started adding in some of the black markings. Because if your character has markings on top, that also affects the way it's gonna look. So I start adding them in to kind of see how the shading and markings are interacting. And then I get to the end, I start doing more of the markings and working on the other side. And I typically, 
What you're supposed to do is kind of work light to dark across the entire head, but I'm impatient and I like to see progress because every time um, I airbrush a suit, I get really nervous, even though I've done this over and over again. Like, what if I screwed up? What if it just looks ugly and no matter how much I airbrush, it's never gonna look good. <laughs> So if I do one side and I start to see it come together, I start to feel a lot better. So that's kind of the method that I go for, but technically you should probably airbrush across the whole thing so you can keep it a little more even. Um, sometimes I'll airbrush like the left side to get it totally airbrushed. I'm like, oh man, that looks great. I'm so excited, I'm gonna mirror it on the other side. And then I can't remember exactly what paints I used in what order. It's like, oh no. <laughs> and it'll start to look weird hard to mirror it so um, if your brain lets you work that way doing it across the whole thing step by step would probably make more sense than what I do but that's the method I use. Um, another technique is doing translucent colors. Um, if I have a character that's got like a pink nose I like to use like really translucent pink and kind of layer it around the nose and the muzzle. So I have my sister Harry Panda around. Since she's got a pink nose, I did super light pink like around the front of the muzzle and then on the lower jaw just to kind of carry that pink throughout. Um, that's just like a personal thing I like to do. I think it looks really cute that way. So that's something that you could try. It also looks cute like on the cheeks. Like if you want rosy cheeks, you could do a little a bit of pink or red on there and that really kind of gives it some character and life. Um, this is more translucent color examples. The cat had a little bit of translucent brown on the muzzle and some pink since it had black gums and a pink nose. I figured I'd kind of combine light and dark colors so it wasn't just straight up pink on there. Um, the dog on the right, he had pink translucent layered on top of the brown. And that was a little bit difficult because airbrushing pink on brown, it kind of just wants to blend in and disappear. So that took probably three layers or so to get that to show up, but I think it's a neat touch. So also on Panda, while she's going around, um, I like to use um, a combination of white paint and the color I'm actually going for on white fur. So I knew I wanted um, a darker line going down from the nose. And like I said, I wanted that translucent pink along with a little bit of gray since she's got black on her. I figured mixing pink and gray would be kind of neat. So I started out by doing a really dark line from the center of the nose down. And then I took a grayish pink and I airbrushed it around the nose and out. And then the final step was going back in, whoops, with white and laying on top of that. And that actually, it just, I don't really know how to describe it, but it just makes this really nice blend. Um, it looks better than just straight up laying translucent pink on top. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I think maybe layering more paint kind of hides imperfections in your trimming and things like that. So it just makes it look more smooth. So when you're starting to do shading, um, you really don't have to do like just brown or black inside the ears. You can try fun colors inside, especially if your character um, is not, you know, a natural color scheme. So on this wolf, it was orange, red, yellow, and I had navy as my dark color rather than just black. So inside the ears, I airbrushed orange first, and then I went in with navy and airbrushed in the middle instead of black. And it still looks realistic because I was trying to model it after a realistic wolf, but you've got those fun colors still, so it kind of jives with the rest of the suit. So that's something you could try. And markings is something that people don't really think about when they're airbrushing, when they're doing like shading and stuff on realistic suits especially. People tend to want to airbrush around markings. They're scared of getting paint on it. And it's okay to airbrush over markings. And it looks much better if you do. Uh, markings are supposed to be part of the character, whether it's a tattoo or like their natural fur markings. 
and shadows and highlights aren't going to magically dodge markings. So you want to airbrush over them and blend it in, and that just makes it look more realistic. So on Buttercup down here, the first photo, um, I had like these yellow little dots all over and I had little yellow flowers. And rather than just avoiding, you know, airbrushing over it, you can see I went ahead and did the brown shading just right over it. Um, it just makes it look nicer. It makes it look like those markings are part of her fur. Then on the cheetah, of course, with the black, um, you know, I airbrushed brown around it. It's kind of hard to see since black is so dark, but I did airbrush over them. And then the sunset wolf I did in the final photo, again, airbrushed all the shadows over it. On this one, I used uh, purple and navy for the shadows. So I just airbrushed like right over all of those markings. And same with highlights. If you're using white for highlights, like go ahead and kind of airbrush over them. So this is another video. We'll see if it'll play. Sweet. So on little detailed markings, like the fox that was going around, uh, those are actually hand painted. I do not like airbrushing itty bitty markings. I know some people can do it, but I don't feel like I have a lot of control over it. So those are all done with a paintbrush. And those paintbrushes that were going around that were all clogged up with paint, that's what I used to um, paint those markings on. Again, if you use like a brand new paintbrush, you're probably going to have a bad time and it's going to be hard to get the paint to stick and look really nice. And something I've learned is using airbrush paint, like that um, golden paint that was going around, and just really loading up the airbrush with, or the paintbrush with paint when you do markings like this. If you just dip it in regular acrylic paint and try and paint, it's just so thick. It's going to sit on top of the fur. It's going to be crunchy when it dries and you're not gonna get like a really clean line from it. So using airbrush paint just lets it soak in. It makes it really crisp and clean. Um, you could water down acrylic like with water, but in my experience, if you do that, you have to be careful, especially where there's short fur. Because one time I was doing it on a white muzzle and there was so much water in the paint that it actually bled through the backing and started like spreading all over the muzzle. So. That's not a good thing. I definitely don't recommend that. Um, airbrush paint's just gonna be easier in the way to go. Um, you can also use paint brushes to sharpen the edges on some markings or blending in mesh. And you also wanna make sure when you're painting markings like that, you want to go in the direction of the fur, even on a curve. So rather than just taking your paintbrush and doing a swirl, uh, you wanna do little hash marks like that to make your swirl. So these are some examples of hand-painted details. Um, on Buttercup, I did a lot of hand-painted details up here around the eyes because it was white fur and I was really trying to blend in that mesh. Um, here on Sergal, kind of the same thing, did a lot of little dots. Uh, Yukiko had some blending and freckles. And here in the corner of the eyes was hand-painted. Um, the cats, around the eyes was painted. Suki did a lot of blending around the mesh. And then Maple at the end, he had a lot of blending around his mesh as well, because I was trying to make him look grumpy. So I did a lot of hand painting around the eyes with dark colors to kind of emphasize that. So around the eyes, it can be a combination of airbrushed or hand painted, depending on what you're comfortable with. If you're not very comfortable, I recommend starting out with hand painting because again, it's easier to control than taking like black airbrush paint around the eyes and accidentally doing it too heavy. Um, adding highlights on top of the eyes make them look more friendly, make them look wider. So on Yukiko up here, I just did a little bit of light paint on the top of the eye. And I did the same thing on Fiddlestick. I just did a little bit of lighter color up there that really opens up the eye and makes it look more friendly. And then, like I said, with maple over here, I wanted the exact opposite. So I did a lot of heavy shadows on top and in the corners of the eyes to make them look grouchy. Eyebrows also enhance the expression. So if you've sewn eyebrows in, you can kind of use paint to maybe 
make the arch a little higher or soften it a bit if you're not completely happy with how um, the eyebrows came out. This is a progression on Yukiko of how I did the eyes. So like I said before, I went around with a lighter color first. I did a beige just to make sure it looked good. Went in with a dark brown and then I ended with a black. Um, and this is the cheetah, which also looked completely different. This one had eyelashes that I hand painted on. You can install like fake eyelashes, but painting them on I think looks more dramatic and is more noticeable. So that's something you could try if you want a more feminine look. Um, you can sharpen lines from sewn marking with airbrushing as well, like I mentioned before. If you want kind of, if you want the markings to look more clean, but you still want them soft, I would use an airbrush. If you want them to be super sharp, I would um, do hand painting. And again, you don't want to use too much water or reducer because it will bead on top. These are some examples, again, of hand painted markings. I, I try to airbrush what I can, especially if it's larger, and then just go in with the smaller stuff. Um, I don't really do this, but you can also use stencils if you're more comfortable with that. I know people have cut out really cool markings, like with a Cricut, or they've cut it out with an X-Acto knife on paper, and then laid it on top and airbrushed it. So that's also an option. And here you can see on the left side where I did use that felt to kind of test out the stripes first. So when I'm blending in mesh, you can't completely hide mesh. It's, it just looks different from the rest of the fur. You're gonna see the holes in the mesh. There's no way that you can completely get rid of it, but you can kind of trick the eye into looking elsewhere and making it not as noticeable. So something I do is kind of make little dots all over around the eye, like pixels, that kind of mirror the holes in the mesh and that kind of distracts um, from the mesh itself. So you can kind of see that there's mesh there, but you might kind of look around the head and see exactly where it's at. You can't just, you know, see a big blob of mesh and like, oh, that's where the vision's at. Um, you can also create like a decoy tear duct in the corner for people to focus on, because most people immediately look to the tear ducts for vision. So on Fiddlestick, I did like a little bitty tear duct there that people would look at first. So here's some examples of some tear ducts I did. Um, on the Sunset Wolf in the third photo, that was, that's one of the easiest things you can do is if you've got complicated markings, carry it over onto the mesh and that helps hide it as well. Um, and the wolf on the far end had like this white line that went down the muzzle. So I carried it right onto the mesh, I didn't go around it and that helps, you know, kind of hide it. So here's a progression of the wolf I did. Uh, you can see in the first photo, obviously, with no mesh painted, it's super noticeable, it really stands out. And in the third photo, just painting that white stripe and having it connect already starts to hide it. In the fourth photo, that's when I added that little fake tear duct. And in the last photos, I did like little dots of shading around to kind of blend it out. And this one is the fox that's going around. Again, having like all those complicated markings on it really helps to hide it. But something else I did is I took little dots of white and put them on the mesh, which kind of draws that white fur um, up and kind of makes it blend in a bit. And then I had gray shading around the eye and I took gray paint and did little dots of gray out into the fur. So that way you can see dots all around it and not just on the mesh. So that's it. We've got about 10 minutes left, so if anybody has any questions. Yes. I can't really, hear you. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't really hear you. <laughs> Sorry. It's loud outside. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, like when you're doing things like stripes, if you do not get the paint 
underneath of the fur, then if it gets ruffled even in the slightest, that marking kind of looks messed up. So what I try and do, especially on long fur, like I'll do the first pass of the stripe with black, let it dry, brush it out, and then I'll actually kind of comb it backwards a little bit and try and airbrush underneath, and then airbrush back over top of it. And it might take three or four times to do that, but eventually you will get the paint kind of into the backing a bit so it's like all the way through and it's not just sitting on top. But that is a good thing to, you know, pay attention to. So, so the design looks good even if it gets ruffled. Yes. My mentor actually does use airbrushing. Uh, you're like the math and the eyes. And the eyes. My issue with airbrushing has always been like, how, A, how do you clean that? And B, do, don't tell you get touched up. Because I think at this way I have to send it back to Costa Rica to get it touched up, which actually is how I lost my first. It got lost in the mail, never saw it. So, oh, no. Yeah, before repair. So. I guess those are my two questions. Um, how do you clean a fursuit head, or I guess any piece with airbrushing, uh, and how often do you need to get it touched up? So, um, airbrushing actually sticks really well if you okay. use high quality paint. Okay. Um, and something else you can do is if you take a blow dryer on low or a heat gun on low, uh -huh. is you can actually heat set it. And just adding the heat on top really makes it stick into the fur and makes it more durable. Um, like airbrush body suits, feet, stuff like that, you can throw in the washer on cold and it will actually stick just fine. Um, if you've got a lot of paint, like on this wool here, I would like hand wash it in cold water. Um, but it will need touched up after a while. Like I had someone come back to me after four or five years and need the suit touched up because it faded a little bit. So it never completely washes off, but if you wear it a lot, yeah, eventually it will need to be touched up. Uh, and I guess, uh, just going along with that question, like, uh, I ended up buying like a little green during Black Friday, one of those like uh, carpet cleaners, and really cool oh, yeah. ones. The, uh, Sky, Sky High Studios had a video on how to clean a fursuit head, both like just with your hands and then with the little green. My other question is, would I be able to use that on this? Like be able to clean it the same way as a suit without it. I know you could on the inside, like use a little green on the inside just fine. Um, I'm not sure what it would do to airbrushing. Okay. I've actually been meaning to buy one and test it out. Okay. So I might do that soon and then post a video on Twitter or something and just see how it works. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, the question goes along with that. Um, what, do you, what kind of detergent do you recommend for washing? Like some people said they use tight all clear that has no dyes or perfumes. Some people said blue light. But do you have a recommendation? Um, I usually use, like you said, any kind of detergent that just doesn't have perfumes, like the all clear one. Okay. Um, I have used Wool Light, and that works great too. It just tends to be a little more expensive. So anything like that will work. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, this is a bit of a different question. I can see that everything's being clear today. Um, where can we find it? I'm, I'm not sure, actually. That's a very good question. Um, they're recording the panels, so you can watch it later. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm doing some airbrush work uh, right now uh, with I'm using a, uh, a flexible rubber-based top coat uh, made for airbrushes, but I'm having a problem occasionally where um, my, it's like, it's like I'll be brushing and then like it will, my uh, paint will stop flowing through the brush. And like if I say like adjust the nozzle side, like if I, I screw it in, screw it out, then I'll get like a little bit more, but then it will stop eventually. And I like just started trying different things. I found that like maybe it's, this is where like the water is running low, because adding water seems to help, but I'm just trying random things to see what it is. Do you have any like insight as to what that might be? Yeah, sometimes it just, it, it wants to clog up, like, sometimes I'll take it apart and there's just this itty bitty piece of fur in there. Um, I haven't tried it out yet, but a lot of people swear by getting, like, the ultrasonic jewelry cleaners and putting your entire airbrush in there. And supposedly that, like, really cleans it and gets everything out. So every time you're done airbrushing, I would recommend really cleaning it with something like that, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that would help because um, I know some fursuit makers are having trouble 
with clogging and they said that solved it because they were just cleaning it by hand before and it wasn't cutting it. So, okay. yeah, trying something like that might work. Yes. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you might want to try replacing your needle. Good point. This is brand new airbrush, so maybe I can damage this Yeah, they're super picky. You can just act, barely bend the end of it, and then it just wants to be cantankerous. Sewing machines are the same way. Okay. <laughs> yes. One thing I know for uh, airbrush needles, um, it's, it's probably better to have multiple ones there, because eventually it will just dry up inside of there a little bit, or you get some, some air back in the line or something like that, and then it's screwed. So you just have another one. Yeah, I know when I was working on Suki's suit, I got halfway through airbrushing, and my airbrush, I could just not get it to cooperate. So I went and bought a new one. So now I've got two, and I kind of switch between them when one's not cooperating, so. And yeah, you can check out the airbrushing on hers, too. Um, white is the hardest to blend the tear ducts in on, so on hers, I did, like, little gray stipples around it, kind of blend it in, and then I did airbrushing around the edges of her markings to kind of sharpen them up on the face. Especially on the moon, because I want it to really look like a moon. Does anybody have any more questions? Yes? When you mentioned like, if you overlay on the nose and the lips, is that like covering water or...? It is mixed with an airbrush reducer, and I just try and do maybe 25% paint to 75% reducer, like really thin and translucent. Yeah, yeah, for some reason that seems to work really well, especially on muzzles, just going back over with a thin layer of white. It just makes the gradient look more natural. Because sometimes when you put on, like, for me, if I put on just a layer of light pink, it gets a little bit blotchy, and that seems to hide the blotchiness. Anybody else have any more questions? Okay, I guess we're done. Yay! Thank you for coming. Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them, whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.